When did I fall in love with theater? Oh gosh, well, like many who write plays, it was very young. I, I think it was, I wrote my first plays when I was in seventh grade. And the years before that, I was just really trying to play with words and talk through words. And uh, I discovered I could write sentences, which I guess was a gift back then. I didn't know it was a gift or, you know, not everyone was interested in writing. I should put it that way. Um, but I was really trying to get my father's attention with Reader's Digest and reading the quote, quotable quotes out of Reader's Digest or the funny stories in Reader's Digest. That was kind of one thing I remember of uh, tr trying to sort of find the phrasing and, and just the way you hear things, the way you hear people talk, and it's very compelling. That merging of like thought and conviction and where does it come from? And so that was kind of the germ of it. Um, and from there, I just, I don't know why I started writing a play in seventh grade. I just started writing scenes of people talking to each other. So, yeah, so that was the early, early hatch of it. And then I went to a performing arts high school in Louisiana, where I grew up. And I wrote plays that were done by my classmates. And one big one that was done uh, in... Um, uh, in front of the whole student body, which is about 2,000 people. And then I acted too for a while, but kept up writing. And my biggest sort of, um, my way to sort of find a theater world outside of where I was, so there's a lot of cool theater going on in Louisiana when I grew up. Um, I was one of the people in the, uh, the Young Playwrights Festival that was held in New York. And so I, I was part of this uh, collective or this, this, this contest when I was 18. And they flew us all up there and trotted us in front of Stephen Sondheim and read our plays and produced our plays at Playwrights Horizons. And that was kind of it. So, yeah. Well, when did I fall in love with writing? And, it, you know, it is a separate question. I don't know if I said anything about it yet. Um, I think it was fun to write. It was fun to play uh, with uh, your fellow players and actors and write things that they could do. And even after I studied it in college, I thought, well, I don't really know if, from everything that all these, these, these teachers, these downtown New York playwrights I, I met and studied with, uh, the lives they were living, I was like, I don't know if I'm living the life, if I have this life as a playwright yet. And um, I mean, I can write, but am I going to make a go of it, like of this path? and see where it, it can get me. Um, and I decided I needed to be in a place where I could just write and live cheaply, but that there was theater, that there were people who were doing this, you know, this, this art, this exotic kind of thing. And um, so I moved to Chicago and uh, spent uh, a great amount of time, a good 10, 11 years there doing plays with friends who were starting theater, theater companies even in like the early nineties. And I just, just wrote my butt off, so to speak. I had, I think four equity productions, full length productions and dozens of shorts done. And it was such a fertile time because the Steppenwolf legacy was still true as advertised. Everyone wanted to be in a theater company there. It was like grad school, except you would meet your friends at bars and talk about ideas and, talk to actors you wanted to write things for and it, anything went. And then there was also the very disciplined uh, folio theater that would do storefront Shakespeare. And, you know, all every, everything was just sort of gurgling up. And that's when I think I really fell in love with playwriting. My process of creating a play, oh boy, I wish there was just one process. Um, <laughs> I think I, um, you know, the exotic thing about playwright is it doesn't just need to be a pitch and a play doesn't just doesn't have to be a story. So it's a little more elusive than uh, sort of the screenwriting world. You can write a play based on an image you have, a character you're obsessed with. And some, depending on your mind, you can file away for years and bring them back when they finally make sense in the thing you're trying to write. Um, but I think before I go to script, go to pages, I wanna know that I've got 
someone or a couple of people I'm writing about and kind of what their dream is, kind of what, what it is they're after. It could be an intention, but what, what it is they really hope to get out of this world, you know? Um, and sometimes it's just about the world, you know? Sometimes I write, like to write about the technological future or which, which could be the technological present right now um, and find the people who should be in that world you know, and uh, who should be taking this journey of like, say, going through a world of AI or going through a world of, you know, crypto or whatever it is. So, um, so there are many angles of entry. And, and so I think your, your job is to sort of develop as many points of entry that could get you to pages uh, quickly, because otherwise you're just kind of an entertaining thinker. <laughs> which I guess people get paid for too, but I, I don't, you know, I haven't had that job yet. I wanted to work with the Antaeus Theater Company because it um, brings together the best stage actors in Los Angeles to keep up the tradition, or the best actors that I know of, um, to keep up the tradition of um, theater. You know, they all have a classical core, many of them teach Shakespeare or classical theater and they actors, the best actors start the best theater companies. Um, sometimes writers do, but it's mostly actors who start these companies. And um, they just were doing things and they, they had started a few years before I joined it, a, a playwrights lab, which uh, harkened back to a lot of great actor, actor companies in New York in the seventies and the eighties. Um, I think one, one of the models of this Playwrights Lab was with Circle Rep, which in, in New York, um, that uh, produced most of Lamford Wilson's stuff um, in the 70s and 80s. And I think they had a Playwrights Lab. And so the idea was to get people writing, give them a place to come and connect with these great actors and develop the best material possible with... Um, writers who've been through some experience. So it's not like a starting place for a playwright. They're, they're looking for people who have some experience and bring voice and sort of wherewithal and the ability to produce to the table. Um, and so that was one of the reasons I found them, I wanna say six years ago, seven years ago, yeah. The, the zip code plays idea was an idea that was um, sort of born before to when the playwrights lab was just when they were in another space in North Hollywood to bring together the playwrights lab and the actors in mass. So it's something we've done before in a much more casual one night environment, invitation only environment. Um, and it was something um, that worked out really well. It was really kind of rambunctious how many people were involved in it the first time. It, um, and so I wasn't surprised when they brought it back. Of course they brought it back because the pandemic prevents us from producing plays uh, in person right now. How can we still stay strong and tell stories together while we're apart? And so they reintroduced the zip code play idea with a call for entries meaning any pe person in the lab, the playwright's lab could submit an idea by deadline this past summer uh, to participate. I'm like, well, let me pick something else, you know? And uh, I think when you think of a zip code in LA, there's many that seem like the obvious choice, maybe Hollywood or downtown or Santa Monica or the beach or wherever you want to pick. And so I always triangulate off of the least obvious choice. Like what wouldn't people pick? And what do I find out about that? And, uh, you know, I threw a couple of ideas at him. You know, I almost wrote about Descanso Gardens and La Cañada, you know, and there's so many things I think you could throw into to the uh, Descanso Gardens up there. But we decided with Sun Valley because I had just been to the auto junkyard up there uh, to find parts for a car I've been putting together over the summer. It's been a hobby of putting this car together. I, I bought for a few grand and I've just been putting money into it all summer. It works. It's great. We're taking on vacation this, this week. Um, 
And um, like anything, sometimes of the moment, you put together uh, things from ideas in your current life. And then the play, as you may have read the log line of it, is, is about two people who have low vision, who could barely see, um, who end up going to find uh, a part for a car that they want to drive in this auto lot. And I, I, I wanted to present the idea of working with people with, uh, who are who had a visual impairment because I work for the Braille Institute during the day. Um, and, you know, there's not enough awareness of what we can do in our lives to eliminate barriers for people who have low to no vision. You know, um, it's you know, people, you know, and it also hits people when, when, it, when they lose their vision later in life, there's all kinds of things that people go through that are emotional and you want to hang on to the things you were doing. And so I took some of those ideas and uh, I said, you know, what? You, there are still some people who lose their vision who still have a car license, who still probably want to drive those few last times that they have a car license. And like, wouldn't this be funny and odd to do this meet cute of people who used to know each other through um, the center um, I can't use, I didn't want to use Braille in, the, in, in, I wanted it to be like an, um, the blind center where one taught the other and one was blind back then. And now the other's blind. And then they go in together and use their skills in this unique friendship to find a car part. So, um, that's kind of how that came together. It's just kind of some quick alchemy of things that were in my life or as Viola Spol and others might say, objects in the immediate environment. So, and it goes deeper, it's a friendship. It's a teacher and student relationship that gets flipped. Um, and you don't know, it's also as they talk um, because it's, it's really Martha's story. Uh, it's two people in their early fifties uh, who's newly going blind. Be free comes back to meeting Billy, who she taught years ago when he was first going blind in his early 20s, and she was a little older than he was. And his life has just gotten better, and hers has gotten worse <laughs> in certain ways. And uh, it's just kind of what's shared and what's known in the disability world is access intimacy of somebody who could be almost a complete stranger who only knew you once, um, who gets gets you, gets your your vibe, the way you need to stand, what you need to get, be productive, how, you know, what you need to walk with a cane through a junkyard. Um, and uh, they may only be in our life for a short period of time, but um, that's kind of what we're investigating in the piece. Our play opens and um, Martha, who has been waiting patiently in front of the junkyard uh, in Sun Valley, um, is waiting for her volunteer. Um, and she, when she meets uh, Billy, um, she doesn't quite remember that she's known him before, but you can tell she's a, maybe a bit of a cynic or a, grim, or, or, or a grump, I guess is the word, you know, it's just wants someone to come in and fill this purpose or she's driven to go find uh, this knock sensor for a 1998 Subaru Impreza she has. Uh, and um, she used to come to the junkyard herself and then just going blind, it's hard to see. So she is, it's even more taken aback when the volunteer arrives in the form of Billy, one that she knew him before, but he also has part only partial sight. Um, and his, his, uh, orientation and mobility, as it's called, um, is a lot better than hers. And his daily living skills are, have been sharpened over time. And, and he's a musician. And he's a musician because she taught him. And so that's kind of woven in through as they walk through the junkyard to find this part, you know. Um, and uh, so it's a lot of catching up, but it really is about can they get this part or not? Can she get back and start the car before a license expires? There's a little bit of a time cap. And then what happens when they find the car finally, you know?
I uh, met them over Zoom. Um, Gigi Birmingham, I have seen uh, act. She's a wonderful company actor and is a, um, a teacher and just known just in theater circles of how great she is. And, uh, she, and um, she plays Martha. And then John Chafin, who I had not seen before, um, who's also incredible. And he's a lot of, he's done TV episodics and um, a lot of stage work. Uh, just has so much finesse and so much um, heart in what he does. Um, both of them, this is the first reading, and I was, I was only in on a couple of rehearsals because it, it soaks up time to have so many rehearsals on Zoom and they were on a, on a, on a union schedule. Um, the, they just had had it down. They had such electricity. Uh, they seemed to really like these, these uh, characters. And I hope you guys do too. I think they sort of present them in a great way. So what do I want the audience to get out of this play? I think what I get out of it, what I, I want the audience to get out of it is that no matter what the obstacles you have in life are to stay open to things changing, to stay open to being surprised uh, uh, because life does and things do. And I think that's kind of the thing to remember. And um, we see it in the play with people who are losing their vision, which is some of our greatest fears. And you can have your greatest fears realized and still come out the other side. You can still live your life. I'm excited about all of the zip code plays. I wanna hear just uh, tapestry is probably too cliche a word, but I want to hear all of the different sounds and rhythms that um, the whole bunch of us have come up with. Cause I know it's, it's going to be different. I mean, mine, mine has like a sort of a musical naturalism to it. And I know a few of them are surreal. A few of them are kind of bizarre histories and uh, earnest histories. And um just as I sometimes just enjoy a great podcast this summer, I want to listen to them all and I want more. Um, I want, I want everyone who comes to this to just want to hear more zip codes, you know, um, this is Antius theater company's fall production and they've made good on it with some amazing people working on it. And I think we're all going to be amazed. Why must viewers listening to the zip code plays, why they must listen is because this is a unique pairing of this particular company's great actors and uh, sound engineer, Foley artist, sound design. It's a unique kind of blend of fictional storytelling uh, paired with playwriting and uh, I think it's unique in that way. I don't, I don't feel fictional podcasting going as far right now as non-fictional podcasting. And this lays a claim to being a very unique, uh, winnable and very wonderful way to sort of stay on the fictional side of things and give people an experience that they'll want more of, so. I think, you know, as, as we all feel what's going on in the city, um, and we're restricted from being out in sort of these artistic settings where we meet other people and connect from concerts, you know, from like the Hollywood Bowl to Center Theater downtown and any of these places that we've taken for granted, we're not there anymore. Um, I think um, as we reboot and renew and turn a corner with the pandemic, Theaters the size of Antaeus and, and, and smaller like Moving Arts is another one. Um, we'll be nimble enough to know how to turn that corner and provide audiences what they need quicker. I'm not saying the bigger theaters won't, but I think that they're able to move and sort of stay in touch with an audience and sort of be there right when we're ready to bring people back inside. You know, there's an, a neighborhood vibe that NTS has cultivated, they have a great newsletter um, and they are just keeping people sort of in the fold, sort of as members, so to speak. 
And they've always done that even before the pandemic and with everything they do. And uh, the center piece of the theater company is um, the library space, which they carried over from the previous space. It's bigger in this new complex in Glendale. And the library space is a meeting place for everything that Ateus does. It's for patrons, it's for audience, it's for readings. Uh, the, the Playwrights Lab meets there. So as soon as we can do big and small things in the library, I, I think they'll do that too, you know. I mean, they're, they're going to be between 20 and 30 minutes. So like podcastable lengths, they're not like these long things. They're, they're, they're stories about our city. And <clears throat> just want people to sort of look at, to see how Antaeus is just trying to stay in touch with its audience through pandemic. And I think they've got a new website that looks great. And they're trying to track what audiences are looking for during this time. They have a reading, a book club going on. Um, they have a lot of innovative things just to keep people interested and engaged. And I think that's great. I think, I think it's great because it, it asks the audience to engage beyond just sitting as an audience member, you know. But I think they're doing a good job with that. Um, and uh, my play, I hope you guys, I, I don't know what order they're going to present them in. Um, and I think they're just going to be a surprise. They're all going to sound so great, such like a perfect package. I mean, I hope that this is like season one of the Zip Code plays and you're coming back here next year to interview the writers who are season two because it's such a joyous idea that, uh, you know, I hope, you know, people have listening parties, people uh, uh, tell people about, you know, it, it's, it's shareable and it's also a nice solo experience. So that's, that's what I think is going to happen.